Welcome to Fear Free Childbirth Podcast with Alexia Leachman, the weekly nine-month podcast to help parents-to-be look forward to their fear-free childbirth. Alexia is a pregnancy and head trash clearance coach and the author of Fear Free Childbirth, How to Have a Stress-Free Pregnancy and a Positive Pain-Free Birth. As a mum who's had two fear-free and pain-free births, Alexia wants to share with you how she overcame her pregnancy and childbirth fears so that you can look forward to having a fear-free birth too. Over the nine-month life of this podcast, Alexia will be sharing some real-life stories from mums and dads, insights into the latest childbirth research, inspiring tales from birth professionals, and some tips and techniques for clearing your fears and stresses. If you would like to receive a free chapter from her book, then head over to fearfreechildbirth.com, where you can also sign up for her email series, How to Have a Stress-Free Pregnancy. But now, it's time for the show. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leachman, and thank you so much for joining me today. Now, on today's show, I'm going to be chatting to doula Nicola Goodall. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast, you'll know that I spoke to a doula a few weeks back. I spoke to Lisa Jane, who's got her business, Doula Mama. And it was a fascinating, fascinating chat. And I had loads of emails from people saying it was just so interesting listening to Lisa Jane talking more about the work of a doula, because I know that many of you listening are really curious about the work of a doula. And I know that when I speak about from my own perspective, before I was pregnant, I'd never even heard of a doula. And it really wasn't something that I was aware of on any level. And so as we, you know, when we become pregnant, we start discovering this whole new world. And the idea that there might be somebody there that can support you during your pregnancy and during the birth just seemed like an incredible thing for me when I found out about it. I was like, wow, that's amazing that women do that. And one thing that I was really curious about, certainly when I was pregnant, was what do doulas do? How do they support you exactly? When do you start working with them? At what point might you start speaking to a doula? You know, all these kind of questions would come to my mind. But also, I think it's really important as well to think about, you know, you're going to be inviting somebody to support you during a very, very intimate moment a very sort of magical transformational moment as well and so it's really important to sort of find a doula that's really going to sort of be a good personal fit for you and your own philosophies and your own way of dealing with stuff the way you know how you want your birth to unfold and and the level of support that you feel that you're going to need during your birth because every woman is different and every birth is different so when it comes to doulas of course every doula is different and every doula will bring something very different to her work because it's a very personal work it, you know you're bringing so much to that role when you're helping a woman and her partner bring their baby into the world it's a really sort of magical time and a very personal time and in order to support people doing that you have to bring a lot of you into that as well so I figured it's really important to get a few doulas on the show so you can get a real flavour of the work that doulas do because I think that different doulas will bring something very different to the work that they do because they're very different as individuals because they're very unique as people as we all are and every birth is different every woman is different and therefore I think it's right to have more than one doula on the show because their work is so fabulous but before I do hand over to the time that I spoke to Nicola I just want to have a little bit of a mention for the UK Podcasting Awards, which I did mention last week. And um, if you haven't voted for the Fear Free Childbirth podcast, I would really appreciate a vote, especially if you're based in the UK. I'm not sure you can vote if you're not based in the UK, unless you could do cheeky stuff with web stuff. I don't know, but I think it's mainly for UK based people. But if you are, I would really appreciate a vote for the podcast. There'll be a link for you within the podcast show notes for today. So I would really appreciate that. And if you really, if you're feeling really generous, you can put more than one vote in by just voting the day after, you know, which would be absolutely fabulous. And I would, I would come over and give you a big squeezy hug if I knew where you were. I really, really would. Um, but anyway, so back to today's show. So today I'm chatting to Nicola Goodall and she is just wonderful. She's also the founder of Wise Women, which is a, a space that she's creating online and through publishing to facilitate a conversation for women to connect 
connect and really to sort of share uh, moments that women's things, you know, sort of really nice uh, traditions and stories and, and, and really a great, you know, tapping back to the idea of when women were very much connect, connected in community. And it's a really, really lovely, lovely thing. And she puts on events and that kind of thing as well. But she's also recently done a TED talk and uh, we certainly share very much the same view on this and her TED talk was called Reframing Birth and it's really how we want to really change the conversation that's happening around birth from this kind of fear-based negative storytelling and narrative that we see everywhere whether it's portrayed in films or on soap operas or dramas or wherever and really start changing that conversation to make it much more positive so that women have got inspirational stories to share that they can be inspired by these positive birth experiences that other women have that that boys can grow up knowing that that men have got a really great role to play with in birth she talks about all that stuff on her ted talk which is just under 10 minutes so if you want to watch nicola in action then you can see the video again on the show notes for today's episode but i'm going to start yapping away right now and just hand over the time that i spoke to nicola all about her work as a doula and how doulas support women in pregnancy in childbirth i hope you enjoy it well, hello, Nicola, and welcome to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. Hello. Thank you for coming on. Now, before we go on and talk about your wonderful work, mm-hmm. would you mind just sharing with us a little bit about how you came to get involved in being a doula and birth working and, and what brought you to do this kind of work? Sure. So I quite often when I introduce myself at workshops, I tell the story because I kind of feel like there are all these threads, you know, that mm. walk to this place where I am now. And, and, and some of it is maybe what might get called fate or kismet or something. My mother was named after her midwife and um, from a, a, a woman that was born in the 30s in a Yorkshire village. She was given the name Olga because oh. her, <laughs> her midwife was Olga. And um, then my sister also does this work and I was named after um, the maternity ward that I was born in and, and my sister's daughter also does. Oh, wow. So we've obviously got some kind of um, genetic, <laughs> genetic thing going on. Yeah. And um, I grew up, I was very lucky in, in the community that I lived in in South London when we all had our babies so my eldest one is coming up to 20 we just supported each other you know we'd kind of make sure everyone was fine and and then when the baby came you know we'd bring food and and help each other with breastfeeding and other kids and and clothes and so on so I just grew up with with that happening naturally and my sister when I fell pregnant with my first baby just said to me you know I'm coming with you and I'm going to help you with this that and the other and she took pictures and she got me a cot and and just really handled that side naturally in a kind of community family way so that was my experience of of having babies and I didn't actually realize that that didn't happen for everybody until I kind of you know started to look around me after having a child myself for a few years and I, I, I got involved in you know learning massage and aromatherapy and and then when I was pregnant with my second child I noticed a, a leaflet up where I was taking prenatal yoga saying that there was going to be this weekend with this guy Michelle O'Don who's this incredible obstetrician that's responsible for us having home-like environments and birth centers and hospitals and having water birth available in hospitals and I thought it would be a really cool thing to go and hang out with him when I was pregnant. Mm. It turned out that it was his first doula training course and I was absolutely broken. I went along with about sort of 10 post-dated checks and <laughs> to the weekend. And, you know, he was just really explaining what had been happening naturally for me anyway. And he was, he was breaking down the science, I guess, behind it and suggesting that, you know, those people that were lucky enough to have that might get out there and share it with the rest of the women of the world. And I kind of went home thinking, well, I probably won't. (laughs) I'll probably just keep (laughs) doing what I'm doing. But I will, like, have my baby, you know, using a lot of the things that he was talking about. And we birthed that baby at home. And we had a great midwife that used to be an independent midwife that worked for the NHS, the health service in, in South London. And then she said to me after the birth, you know, you really should. You really should get out there and, and support other people. 
And I just thought, okay, okay. You know, you just you have these chats, don't you? And you, you make these lists and <laughs> yeah. promises to yourself. And then I had the next baby, and she came again, which was just fabulous for us. And, and she gave me a real mummy telling off after that baby and said you have to it's absolutely essential and you know basically it's unfair if you don't (laughs) I had that baby I moved to Scotland and um, I I was then out of my community and away from my family but still felt like I wanted to do that kind of work with women so I did start to work with women that um, I didn't know Mm. so that was the beginning so did you start out working as a doula then yeah, yeah. I mean, in in the sense of that we understand it now. Mm. Before they these guys coined this term doula, you know, women have been doing it for mm. after as long mm. as we've been having children, really. Mm. Mm. So, in your work uh, in the early days of, of being a doula, what was the what was the thing that you found the most was there anything that you found most challenging at that point? I think. Our health service is very challenging in some respects. It's really amazing in many respects. Like my experience having my babies was fabulous. Mm. Um, but then it's this huge old lady, you know, that's yeah. like clunking along. And sometimes it works really well and sometimes it works really, really badly mm. and people are ignored or somebody's having a bad day and so they treat the person that they're supporting badly. And, you know, that's, it's really frustrating. It's mm. really frustrating. Mm. So for women that are thinking about working with a doula, but before we sort of talk about that bit, would you mind just sort of those that maybe don't know what a doula is, sort of describing or explaining what a doula is and how you see it? Sure. So I have this theory, really, that, you know, women are very good at growing, birthing, feeding and caring for their babies and and men, too, Mm. if if they have a certain setup around them. So love and care and, um, you know, access to facilities. So I see the role of the doula as the facilitator of that process. So sometimes we have very, very little to do. And other times we have much to do, depending on what holes are in that network. For- mm. So, you know, you can I can find myself working with one person who wants to have her baby at home without a midwife and, and is just doing it completely at one end of the spectrum. And then I can find myself in a theatre while somebody's having surgery at the other end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. you know. And, and so we're doing whatever the what the woman needs to, to have that process facilitated with love and mm-hmm. support. Mm. And do you find that, um, is there a certain kind of woman that tends to hire a doula in your experience? Or is it really, really sort of wide ranging? It's so wide ranging. It's, you know, there is a real, um, there is a real gang of kind of educated middle class white women that are reading and studying when they're having their babies. So they come across the idea of a doula. Mm. Um, But outside of that, you know, it's, it is as many kinds of women that have babies will want support when they're having their babies and increasingly it's becoming more diverse and people are kind of specializing within different communities and groups and, um, yeah, so it could be anybody, young, really young, and, and you know, right at the other end of the, the, the age range. I've worked with a woman that was 48 and, and women having their first baby, and I was with a woman having her seventh baby recently. Wow. it's it's really varied and I feel like it I feel we have many blessings doing this work and one of them is the wide range of women we get to meet and hang out with you know Mm. and share life with for a little bit Mm. and so that journey that you're with her on when does that journey typically start in her pregnancy so you know ordinarily what happens in the UK is people get to a certain stage in their pregnancy maybe you know the last trimester and they're maybe like six weeks away from having their baby Mm. and then they do their education yeah so they might have some um, health service education or they might have some private charity education or they might do hypnotherapy there could be anything yoga and they start to realize that um you know, there may be a gap in the services provision for them in terms of the fact that we're very overstretched. So there may be some time on their own or um, there may be a lack in breastfeeding support or, you know, they're just identifying that there's a hole to be filled, actually. Mm. 
So, so very commonly, it's at that stage. If they know about doulas before that, you know, I mean, I've had people contact me before they're even pregnant and saying, I'm thinking about having a baby and, you know, so I'm chatting to doulas now. So, you know, you do get wow. the occasional woman that's sort of a couple of weeks pregnant saying, I want it from the beginning all the mm. way through. That's very wise, mm. you know, that's very wise. But, but ordinarily towards the end of their pregnancy. Mm. So what if they sort of get in touch with you at the end of the pregnancy, how might that sort of unfold for them then in terms of the contact and the way that you might support them? So all doulas work differently and a lot of doulas have a quite strict package of, you know, I'll see you a couple of times and then I'll come to your birth. But I'm a little bit different because I think the better I get to know the woman, mm. the more use I can be to her and the easier my job is. You okay. know. So... Um, I will try and see them, you know, as much as I can, really. And towards the end, when they're kind of, I don't know, 38 weeks or something, I like to try and see them once a week, mm -hmm. just for, to go for a walk or have an ice cream or, you know, just, just hang out and chat and find out what makes them tick and what's important to them and what they're frightened of and, and just connect, really. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. so they trust me more and, and I love them more and, you know, mm. the relationship is tighter and stronger by the time they have their baby. Mm, mm. So you mentioned just a minute ago that it was those women that maybe sort of get a doula involved early on in their pregnancy, that that was wise for them to do that. What, what makes you say that? I think because then what they have a whole lot more time, you know, to learn about things, their choices, what the potential is for them and to have that one person that's the continuum throughout the process you know somebody that they can turn to because you know what happens here generally is you know you'll go for your clinical care and unfortunately there's not enough time and resources for the person providing your clinical care to say how are you doing mm -hmm. how's your relationship you know oh feeling sick that must be hard how are you coping with that you know <laughs> kind of giving them the the chat that they need really to, to yeah. find their own solutions and also just to give them a bit of room to say this is incredible you know I'm really enjoying it I'm, I'm amazed at what my body is doing and all of the, the the thought process you're supposed to go through when you're when you're having a baby you know so the, the earlier that happens the more time they have to do that and 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 they can call on us when they have an issue that they can't resolve and sometimes we can help them resolve that mm. so I guess you find that you're in, in your um, work as a doula that you're bringing so much to that role and so much because there's going to be so many ways that a woman is going to need support that yeah. in some ways it's very hard to predict but and so you just kind of need to be ready to maybe help them in in any number of ways yeah sure so sure. what kind of um just tell talk us a little bit about some of the sort of other ways that you might be supporting them that is that maybe isn't really obvious to anybody else than other than those that like you that are doing that work all the time you know what I think the most common feedback that we get as doulas is the, the reassurance that women have mm. and men and grandmothers, etc., of knowing that there's somebody there okay. or somebody coming or somebody that you can call. Yeah. You know, so that they have that person. So, when, you know, when you work postnatally yeah. with a woman, that's, that's the most common thing you hear is, you know, actually the rest of the week is bearable because I know that you're coming on that day so that if it's hard I have some food someone to talk to the potential for rest and and, and problem solving etc so it's mm. just being a presence you know mm, mm, mm. and you meant, just mentioned dads yes. so what about dads I mean these are these these they often get forgotten in all of this birth prep don't they and they need as much support as the the, the mum, you know. So, what, how, what kind of stuff might you be doing with the dads, or do you just sort of spend time with the dads as well? Definitely, I think it's really important for us to get to know them as well, and to hear their fears and their hopes, and and to answer their questions. Because you're right, they are sometimes put to one side. Mm. I think we do probably on the day, you know, when the woman is birthing, we're probably working more with the father than we are with the mother because mothers you know birth beautifully if all of that structure that we spoke about earlier is in place so mm. you know what, what's happening then is you're supporting the dad to to help their partner if they feel like they're struggling in any way and you're you're normalizing the process and also you're the 
the pacer. Like I read a great article about pacing. So you know, the pacer is the person that sets the pace in the in the room. So if you're very relaxed and snoozing or knitting or mm you know, chewing gum or whatever you're doing that suggests that it's all, it's all cool. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes labor and birth can be quite tempestuous. If the dad can look at you and say, well, she's knitting, so this is normal. <laughs> or they could look at you and say, oh my God, she's vomiting. Is that normal? <laughs> yeah. And you can just give them a nod. It's very reassuring for them. Mm-hmm. I remember my, my midwife spent a lot of time knitting in my first birth and um, it's just that nice little calm presence by the window which is very yeah. very calming so I totally get what you mean by that yeah and yeah. so you, you talked about some of the fears that dads might have what kind of um, fears do you come across uh, quite a bit with dads I think dads are concerned for the health of their partner and their child and I also think they're concerned that they won't be able to provide the support that Mm. their partner needs because it's a new thing, right? Mm. It's like going up a mountain or sailing or something. (laughs) The first time you do something, you can have some nerves around that, you know, Mm. and it doesn't always come naturally to a man to provide a sort of midwifery role, Mm. if you like. And I'm not talking about clinical midwifery. I'm talking about you know, the kind of long support and, you know, encouragement and so on. And and also just to, you know, when, when we're pregnant, our relationship changes quite a lot, doesn't it, with mm. our partner because of hormones and so on. And and so I think that they, they're, they're just concerned that they won't manage. Mm. And actually, a lot of what we do isn't saying, well, if you don't manage, I'll do it for you. A lot of what we're, we're facilitating during the pregnancy particularly is saying, I think you'll manage just fine. You know, you're doing really well just now loving this woman. Why wouldn't you do do well loving her while she's birthing your baby? And just building their confidence and supporting them, you know. Mm -hmm. So in terms of helping the mum to prepare then, Mm. what kind of, um, do you you spend some time on the actual childbirth education or is it around about the birth planning? How much do you sort of overspill into maybe other areas rather than just sort of planning and how it's how you're going to be facilitating them during the birth you know as you start noticing these gaps that need filling what you know it sounds to me like it can be very difficult to maybe define that level of support that you give and it could become quite a large role is is that how it might turn out it can be definitely and it depends on you know people's um structure we work with a lot of people when you live in a city as a doula you work with a lot of people that are away from home Mm. and you know if somebody's family are all in Australia and friends etc and they've only just arrived six months ago you're playing a much greater role probably Mm their world than somebody whose mum lives around the corner they're still around all their school friends their sisters have had babies and so on then you're playing a much lesser role Mm. so yeah you you, it would it would definitely depend on the woman and and um and how she's set up but yeah sometimes you know you're really when i'm training doulas i'm always telling them you have to go in and you have to love them Mm. like they are your child or your sister or your best friend that's yes. that's the level of support that you have to give them that's what they're paying you for essentially mm. you have to take that role very seriously mm. and that must be quite challenging or difficult to kind of open yourself because that that requires quite a bit of vulnerability on your part I would imagine to really open yourself up to be able to love somebody like that within such a short time frame and to help them with such a massive thing in their lives yeah yeah it does but you know also I mean we all have to be vulnerable to to share love and but the reward that we get is love is an incredible thing right Mm. so that we get to love a whole load more people than we might have done if we weren't doing this this work and you know we have all of these incredible intimate moments that we Mm. share with families and we watch you know these these people fall in love again with with each other and then their child and you know we get so many rewards for the hard work that Mm. we put in i know just hearing you talking about that you know the 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 birthing moment whenever i just see pictures of newborns and that you know those images that you see of mums that have just seen their little ones for the first time that sort of magical moment of birth and just to be privileged and honored to be president so many must be such a i don't know so magical for doulas to be able to experience that sort of regularly it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, it's a holy moment, literally. Mm. 
people yeah. and you get to see it all the time and and you know on a sort of scientific level what's happening is you know to to create love we're creating oxytocin and the more oxytocin you create the more love you can feel and receive and give and so you know you often find that midwives and doulas and other different birth keepers are, are just um, their, their capacity for love is, is huge. Mm, mm. And so do you, what kind of uh, personal practices do you have, if any, that help you in, in being the best that you can in your work? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves how hugely important this is for these people you know having that this is although we're seeing it all the time this is this incredible moment in their life Mm. that they'll never have again for this Mm. child and so we have to keep keep our eyes on that and I think also we have to make sure that we um, love ourselves and develop ourselves it's very very important so we have to know when we're too tired Mm. we need a break we have to know when we're too jaded say Mm. or when we have something going on in our life that means that we can't care for them you know, to the to the best of our capacity. Yeah. I believe that we have to have complete faith in the process, whatever that means. So, you know, maybe you're religious or maybe you're a scientist or, you know, whatever the, the faith is that you need to have, you mm. need to have that faith that the process will work out just perfectly. Mm-hmm. And just speaking about the religious aspect, does, do, they, do diff- people from different faith backgrounds have diff- diff- varying beliefs around how that birth needs to unfold and, and do you need to sort of take into account some of those when you're present definitely definitely I teach a, a workshop actually and I'm doing it on Monday called developing spirituality around birth and mm. and it's really preparing doulas and midwives for actually really um but unpicking that with parents so you know saying to them what where do you turn if if you're on a ship that's sinking? Mm. What do you do? <laughs> you go yeah. finding out what it is that they do, whether they call on God, whether they it's important for them to think about the rest of their life, or whatever it is, whatever their coping mechanisms are, mm. whatever it is that grows and develops that kind of love center for them. So we do, we have lots. I mean, I find it much easier when someone says to me, okay, I'm a Catholic, I'll go and say the rosary because then it's very clear during birth if there is a moment when when they need to to, to find their way mm-hmm. and they're stumbling so that you can say to them, okay, maybe, you know, and they say, what shall I do? You can say, well, you told me that, you know, saying the rosary works really well for you. And they go, of course, yeah. and I go to do it. I mean, it's a great tool, you know, if you know where, where people turn. Yeah, yeah. And what about rituals then? Are there sort of, are there, are there some mums that kind of, um, that, that are asking for certain rituals to take yeah. place in that? So what, what, some, what might some of those rituals be? Yeah, so people are really... Um, beginning in the last kind of 10 years I think to start to realize that that's part of the human condition that Mm -hmm. when you meet a big transitionary moment in your life that you probably honor it in some way Mm -hmm. so that is coming back so in pregnancy people are now often um, taking part in these things that are getting called mother blessings okay which are a kind of deeper version of a baby shower and they're centered around the mother and not mm-hmm. the baby. So you commonly you'll have all your women folk over and we will treat the mother like a bride. So I went to one last week and it was absolutely lovely. She had a henna painting on her tummy. We all wrote wishes for the baby. We ate loads of really amazing food. Uh, She had her feet washed. We made her a crown of flowers. It was just lovely. (laughs) Sounds lovely. It was really, really nice. (laughs) And the the impact of those things is not to be underestimated. Mm. It's a real preparation and saying to the world, I'm ready now. Mm. but also for the baby i can imagine all those women focusing on all the people present focusing on the mum focusing on the bump and the baby Mm. and that that kind of you know not prayer but that intent that well that that love that's directed towards mum and baby will have such an impact on that growing baby as well yes and you know we we're having so much more awareness now around the power of intention and Mm. So when I was just discussing actually with somebody yesterday, I had a professor of sports science in a a birth education class I ran once and he said, you know, we have so much science around this kind of thing that um, he he just can't believe that we don't all just apply it to birth because every professional sports person does that kind of thing. Mm. 
maybe not the the kind of nice mother blessing, but they're all imagining that it's all it's going to go well and everyone's going to support them and they're going to win and their muscles are going to work perfectly and. Mm. and so why why don't we just do that same thing when we're birthing our children? Mm. Well, I went through that. That's what I did because I, I um, in my other work as a coach, like the, the power of visualization and yes. the, the the way you know science knows that this stuff works. Sports people like to say do it all the time, and so I employed that very technique to visualize my birth. I visualized how long it was going to be, how smoothly it was going to go, how baby was going to know what baby was doing, and how my body knew what it was doing, and how it was just going to go so smoothly it's amazing the time that I'd set in my head for how long it was going to be baby showed up two minutes before that time was up as if baby sort of went oh my goodness I've got to be out in two it's minutes time. Like, she just shot out like within suddenly I, it was like oh my god she's coming bang and out she pops in one contraction it's, it's really strange but I really do believe that that visualization was such a crucial part yes. of that positive birth that I had you know and I do yeah, agree, we really need to bring more of that into the birthing preparation, absolutely. Yeah, we do. And I think that doulas, you know, are very good. And, and midwives that are able to work independently with, with women are very good at doing that. You know, mm. rolling up to the house or, or to the ice cream joint or wherever you're meeting the mum and saying, how are you doing? You look wonderful. This is going to be great. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of geeing them up for the big mm. race, if you like. And what about when you, I mean, do you come across mums that maybe are just really struggling emotionally with that pregnancy journey and, and maybe are full of fear and a bit sort of, you know, you really do maybe need to sort of step up on the emotional support because that's maybe where they're struggling. With. Maybe, you know, I, I'd imagine that, you know, there's some relationships maybe break down during pregnancy oh, because yes. it's such a high sort of pressured potential situation what about in those times of course I mean we are really you know sometimes we are working with people that are saying to us I had a terrible time last time so I'm really frightened this time or my mum has made me really frightened or um, mm. I'm not confident with my man or there is some real you know there is some real issue that you're supporting mm. them through and and you know you basically you, what you're doing is just giving them a forum to be heard actually mm. I don't think any of us are veering into the world of counselling or or, or relationships relationship healing yeah. what we're doing is just sitting there saying okay that's tough isn't it I'm mm. listening you know mm. I'm listening I'm listening I'm listening and then what happens is people generally work out their own you know problems yeah 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 but that is definitely part that's definitely part and sometimes you think I don't know if this family are going to survive this process mm. and, and and they do you know yeah. they do generally they do yeah they do. yeah yeah and if they don't maybe that was their journey anyway and, and yes. that's yeah. that's part of what's going on for them and so just um we just talked about the, the the science guy and how he was talking about how there's other stuff that we know that we're that, that we're aware of because of science and the human body but not applying to birth is there anything else that you can think of that we really could do with bringing into the birthing world that maybe some people are doing on the on the quiet but we need to really maybe bring out more into the open and get more people n knowledgeable about or, or practicing is there anything that you can that you can think of that kind of fits that i think you know, the most pertinent issue for me is that what we know is if you love a woman and give her a good environment, she will probably birth really well and everyone will be happy and safe. Mm. But what we're doing is we're making this process into a bit of an assembly line with our institutions. So, you know, you're coming in and there's a lot of ticks lists that have to happen and I, I think a really good example is when I had my last baby this is baby number four and by this point I'd had three other babies that I'd fed for a total of five years between the three of them and she got to the appointment where she had to talk to me about breastfeeding and she started to go through the tick list do you know breastfeeding is good for you and oh, it's yeah. baby and so on and I was really like you know I fed my babies for so long <laughs> I, you know it's a great discussion to have and all but like I really don't need to have it and she couldn't not have it she mm. had to still tick the boxes mm. that's what she had to do you know that's her that's her job so what we're doing is we're taking out common sense and love and uh, creating this this lovely environment in in response what we're doing is putting a lot of machinery and forms and so on and and, and actually a lot of those people they want to create that nice environment and and have that time to to love and engage but they've got so many bloody bits of machinery and forms to fill out there's just no time no. 
Oh, there's no time. Yeah, so I think that if, if, if I had anything that I wanted to do, it would be to, to let women and families have more engagement, you know, on a personal level. Mm-hmm. And I've got a real bee in my bonnet about, um, about, about the spread of negativity around birth. And I think that the role, you know, fear we know has got such a huge damaging role in birth and to sort of really let's get rid of the fear but yet everybody around us talks about you know we hear a lot of negative birth stories we see on the tv a lot of really bad examples of birth and and I find that that is something that I really think we need to try and limit and really encourage the positive birth stories and bring out the positivity around birth because I think that can play a huge role in helping women to Absolutely. come into that process with less fear right. is that what, what else do you think we could do around that to kind of you know I um you know I did this TED talk recently which is how we came into contact with each other and they gave us this um kind of overarching theme for the day which was seeing things differently and my immediate thought was I have to I have that's what I have to talk about is that we have to reframe how we see birth mm. because you know we look at birth in the media and that's how we learn about it because your mum doesn't give birth to your sister upstairs anymore when you're little and the woman next door is not giving birth to her twins while you know you're 15 and you're taking soup and so on because we used to learn organically didn't we so now we learn about birth from EastEnders and Twilight and The Walking Dead and (laughs) these horrific and one ball every minute (laughs) awful terrible birth and then also we have this kind of pervasive culture where the I, I used to take my eldest daughter to school and every single day as soon as this woman saw I was showing with my second baby she'd sit down next to me and tell me some awful story about her neighbor bleeding to death and this <laughs> It's terrible, like every day I used to hide from her and that's quite normal. So I think what we need to do is we need to counterbalance that. Mm. We need to petition EastEnders and say, how about you have like a home birth? Yeah. <laughs> or somebody like breastfeeding their baby, you know, how about we, you know, have, the, I mean, the walking dead birth was such a good example. You had, a, you had an opportunity there for somebody to just give birth. She could have just given birth. You know, like most women around the world do just give birth. But instead, they have her son. I mean, spoiler alert, if you're not (laughs) the point. But they have her son cut her baby Uh. out of her in labor and then shoot her dead in the head. It's the most horrific thing that you could possibly, you know, which is great TV, right? It's awful. That's what we watch The Walking Dead for. (laughs) But we need to, we need to, we need to petition the media. We need to sit down next to the woman in the playground and say, oh, when I had my babies, it was incredible. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, wow. This like holy moment that I get Mm. to see all the time and, and redress that problem. We need to go into school and we need to show images of people giving birth with joy and mm. and with the hard work and determination. We need to see dads, you know, really taking part and helping so all the little boys grow up knowing what their capacity is for support and help. And mm. we've got a lot of um, damage to undo, I think. Yeah. Well, I started a petition against Channel 4 to portray childbirth in a more balanced view because I was just fed up with this series after series of one born yeah. every minute. Yes. So, but I didn't think, that, yeah, I mean, include the BBC in that too. So maybe I should edit my petition at change.org if anybody wants to sign that. Yes. It's, uh, details are on the fearfreechildbirth.com website. Um, uh, yeah, but petitioning yeah. absolutely just to portray childbirth more positively. But I also think women need to, like, there's a lot of women that are kind of happy talking about their negative birth experiences but one thing I find like have a lot of women I talked on the podcast that I bring on that talk about their positive birth stories and one thing I hear quite a lot is that when a woman has shared a positive birth story once or twice she learns not to do it again because of the response that she gets from other women and they either don't want to hear it they cut her short or they just tell her she was a fluke or or they dismiss it in some way and and so they end up keeping it to themselves and that's what I think is quite tragic is the fact that we're not uh, we're not other women aren't allowing us to share those stories for the benefit of future mums and future babies and we really need to start calling up those women and and saying hey stop doing what you're doing yes you might have had a difficult journey and that was your journey it doesn't mean you've got to ruin it for somebody else who hasn't yet walked that path you know yeah yeah and make them really frightened I, I went to see Amanda Palmer a few weeks ago and um it was an incredible gig and she was very pregnant 
very round, very beautifully pregnant, talking about having a baby on stage, singing with her doula, and just, you know, it was, it was really positive for pregnant women and mothers and so on. And uh, in the middle of it, she brought up a, a, a stand-up comedian woman, and they started to have a bit of banter about birth, and it was funny, you know, it was funny. And um, this woman in the crowd, it was very interactive, said, you know what, I had a great time having my baby. I had a great time. It was fine. I felt great afterwards. It was all wonderful. And the comedian said, ah, oh, yeah, bitch, and then carried on with her routine. <laughs> it was just absolutely awful. Why couldn't somebody just be like, high five, that's great. What yeah. a great story. You don't hear that very often, do you? And actually, you know what, I, I'm, you know, I've been at tons and tons of births, and a lot of women have a good time having their baby. And the ones that don't, still say, well, I didn't have a good time, but I'm incredibly proud of my achievement. Mm. Look, I've done, I've grown a baby and birthed a baby. So yeah. it's more common than not that people feel proud of what they've done. So mm. we, we should reflect that in our storytelling and our media. Mm. So just going back to the, you just mentioned, you know, you've been present at so many births. On mm. the whole then, you know, if there's somebody listening to this that's pregnant and is maybe slightly worried about how her birth is going to go and, mm. oh, and worried that it might go wrong and all these things that might go wrong, how, on, on the whole you know you just said that most of them do feel positive about what happens is there a little bit more you can tell us about that about how you know births unfold for you typically or i, I know typically it's just such a bad word because I you can't say yeah. that but it's so <laughs> there is no typical birth but you, you know what i mean if people feel safe and they feel loved they generally no matter how it works out get to the other end of it and and are really proud of themselves and it's a real transitionary moment and while I was getting the the TED talk together I did a little bit of research where I spoke to women about how they viewed birth before they had their baby and how they viewed birth you know looking back at it and the before they had their baby bit was you know as you expect from our discussion oh it's mm -hmm. going to be awful it's dangerous there'll be blood everywhere etc yeah, yeah. and the after bit was just just woman after woman saying, wow, that was incredible. That was incredible. That was incredible. And then the odd one saying, okay, yeah, so that was excruciating, but I did it. And yeah, look yeah. what I did. I managed and I always knew I could manage and, and how that set me up for the rest of my life as a woman, knowing that I had that strength and that capacity. And I think that's generally, you know, what I'm seeing is incredible woman after incredible woman going through this huge process of having to birth a baby you know it's it's, it's massive it's massive yeah, and we yeah. don't give it enough kudos at all yeah. and so you know really woman after woman managing you know like like women have and and being proud of themselves yeah. and and me being able to say wow i'm pretty proud of you look what you just did that was incredible yeah yeah it is it is and i i, I still you know I've, I've only had two i haven't had to do more than that. i don't have any plans for any more but i i'm in awe of what the body is able to achieve and how the woman's body changes and how the body is designed to birth and the amazing things that happen and it, it's just an incredible an incredible thing to to know that your body can do that and then now sort of my little one's now eight months and body's getting back to not back to normal so i don't think it ever will but get, getting back to something a little bit like it used to look kind of yes. thing and yeah. and how it just does that you know you don't have to nature's just doing that for you and it is just quite yes. an, an awesome thing yeah yeah exactly and, and you know we have this we don't really doubt our ability to grow a baby during pregnancy which is i mean the the, the human body is incredible right and you're mm. growing that nervous system that bones <laughs> yeah. towards everything you're you know you're growing eyes and nobody <laughs> nobody nobody bats an eyelid at that but then all of a sudden we get to this point where we're you know opening the cervix and the womb is pushing that baby out through your body and we all start to doubt our ability to do it i find it it's incredible it's incredible mm. that we mm. can do one thing and not even notice it barely and then the other thing we make such a, a big fuss about and doubt mm. and then when i hear women you know discussing when I was, there was a program that we had on the uk uh, not long ago called i think it's born to be born or 
um, mm. a documentary and there's some women discussing cesarean sections and just saying oh well, like this is a na- it's not natural to birth a baby i'm gonna i'm booking myself in for a c-section yes and hearing that. phrases like that just really really make me very uncomfortable because it's like it's of course very it's uncomfortable <laughs> and that that was such an interesting bit of television for me because they edited it so well because it was friend after friend after friend saying it's horrific oh my god childbirth oh, oh like, and, and then you know they're cutting to the mother's face and she looks absolutely petrified and not one of her friends are noticing how frightened they're making mm. their friend feel yeah. <laughs> just, and it's because I think we don't have that forum to discuss what happened that we do that that we sit at the the lunch table with our friends and tell them the horror stories or on the bus or in the school playground because we don't have a doula or a midwife that we can turn around to afterwards and be like, whoa, I need to talk about that. Mm. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's what you've hit on it there. It's that the reason that so many women like to share those negative stories is because of their own experience. They just need to talk about it and, and deal with it and process it. And yet there isn't that support available to them. And so all the other mums and future mums hear them and, that, and that's the shame really is that those, those women do need that support so they can move on and and think about their own birth the births that they've had in a more positive way so they don't feel the need to keep talking about them negatively yeah and you know if we were to sail around the world and i think having a baby is way more incredible than sailing around the world but if we were to sail around the world can you imagine if we didn't talk about it afterwards? Mm. <laughs> yeah. But allowed to, that would be so unnatural and weird, wouldn't it? You know, probably what we do is we don't stop talking about it for about a year afterwards and all our friends and family have had enough about hearing about all the, you know, the, the difficulties and the wondrous things that happened while we sailed around the world. But we do this momentous thing of having a baby and sometimes that can involve some real brutality or some real incredible moments and we're not allowed to talk about it. It's, mm. it's very unusual human behaviour. Yeah, very much so, very much so. Well, I'm, I'm just conscious, we could be chatting about this for ages, Nicola, but I'm just conscious we're kind of running out of time. Is well, there anything, um, you know, for any mums that are pregnant, listen to this and they kind of, I, I find there's a lot of pregnant mums listen to this and they love listening to it week after week because it's really helping them to kind of prepare for birth. Is there any final little piece of advice you might have for mums like that listening to the podcast? So people ask me that all the time. What if you could say one thing, yeah. what should people do? And I, I they were pretty much you know it changes over the years obviously but for the last few years and I think from now on I'll say the same thing which is the more you can get in contact with your kind of raw human wild self the better so you know go swimming naked in the sea if you can start dancing if you've stopped dancing and singing and and just you know go and do yoga scream at your partner and throw things if you need to just be you know a real human being and then and then when you come to the probably the the realest part of being a human being ever of pushing a baby out um then you'll probably come to it a little bit more naturally than if you're very kind of we're very organized aren't we and very mm. tidy and neat and and pressed and we don't really dance freely in the uk say and we don't like to sing in public very much and so the you know the more you can do of that kind of thing the better brilliant i love it i love it i love it thank you so much nicola it's been fabulous speaking to you today thank you so much yeah i've enjoyed myself nice to meet you now uh, if people want to find out more about you and your work where can they find out about you nicola online and facebook sure. and all that good stuff so i have a site for myself which mm. is nicola the birthkeeper.com and then i have a um a site for an organization that I'm running called Wise Women and Wise Women is set up to um, facilitate sharing and learning in groups of women because that's how we used to traditionally learn right we'd all go to the well together and chat and somebody would have morning sickness and somebody else would Mm you should probably have this tea, it might help. So I've, I've set up this organisation and we have a very small um, publishing company and we have a blog and we have workshops. So you can you can just Google wise women with a Y instead of an I and, and you'll probably find our site. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to have all the links to that on the podcast show notes that you can listen to. So it'll be fearfreechildbirth.com forward slash Nicola and all the links will be there on the podcast show notes. Well, thank you once again, Nicola, for joining me today on the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. It's been fabulous. Thank you for tuning in. 
You've just been listening to Alexia Leachman from the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, she'd really love it if you left a review on iTunes or Stitcher or shared it with a friend. And don't forget, to get a free chapter from her book, head over to fearfreechildbirth.com to get your copy, as well as finding other episodes in this podcast and more about how Alexia can help you with pregnancy and birth preparation coaching. Until next time.